It's D-Day for South Africa's position in the World Government Bond Index. Quite interesting because as the country prepares to exit level five of the COVID-19 lockdowns, the bond market is preparing its exit from the World Government Bond Index. Before this, economists had warned that between eight to $11 billion of outflows would result as a result of the exclusion, South Africa's exclusion from the WIGBY. And this is because of mandates or investor mandates in which they're only allowed to hold uh, investment grade bonds in their portfolios and not junk rated bonds like ours. But does the, do the forecast rather still stand or has COVID-19 changed things a little bit? So I am now joined to discuss by Rasha Tayob, who's a fund manager at Abex Investments and James McDonald, who is CEO and CIO of Hercules Investments. Jamesman, thanks so much for your time. And Rashad, I'd like to begin with you because we did know that this was coming when, you know, Moody's finally stopped cutting us some slack as it were. But what we have seen is we've seen the RAND and we've also seen uh, the bonds uh, trading quite firm and get, gathering quite a bit of support. My question is, what does change now when we get excluded from the WIGB? Yeah, this was coming for a long time. In fact, for, for many years, it's almost all we were thinking about. Uh, but like everything which has been telegraphed for a while, what you find is that when the event actually happens, it, it actually uh, becomes less, it actually mm -hmm. has less of a market impact because everyone has had a long time to prepare for it. Now, the estimates were anywhere from between a billion dollars, people thought for up to maybe eight, nine, ten billion dollars. But I think if you look at the market reaction, it's definitely at the lower end of the estimates. Uh, the other factor is that uh, mm. the uh, rebalancing was postponed by a month. So we were meant to fall out at the end of March, but given the whole crisis, uh, provided the, the you know, index provider decided that we, they would delay that. And I think that also provided us a bit of time. I think if you look at the market environment, it's more important to focus on fundamentals and what the valuations are rather than technicals around indices because those are quite transitory. And if you look at it, you're really seeing the impact of that in terms of this week where you're having a ripple event, bonds are stronger, the RAND is recovered from its worst level, and in fact, this index uh, exclusion that we've been talked about for, for the last two years has become a non-event. Uh, certainly. And James, to, just to bring you in here, I do understand that uh, Hercules Investments has around $200 million of assets under management. And I'd like to ask about your exposure to South Africa, particularly our bond market, and what changes for you when we are excluded from the WIGBY. The exclusion from the index, uh, as Rashid said, is not a big deal. Uh, but it does introduce an entirely new opportunity set for investors with a higher risk appetite uh, for these type of rated securities coming from governments. I also like Russia in this space. Uh, now I can look at South Africa as an allocation uh, for our growth focused clients as we look at into the recovery phase of this crisis. It is important to understand that this exclusion uh, is just the beginning of the problems because of the debt to GDP levels and because of the cost mm -hmm. of, of servicing uh, all of South Africa's obligations. Understand that there was stagnant growth going into this before the crisis. Now that the crisis has come, uh, these are going to be challenging times and we're going to see unprecedented levels of budget deficits which are going to put pressure. But South Africa is a strong country. It's not going away. Uh, they will borrow. They will find the capital to service these notes. And what we're doing here is looking at opportunities for our clients to get higher yields on their investments. Um, and although that index will exclude South Africa, there's going to be a whole other class of investors who are interested um, in high yield debt uh, that will come in and provide support over the long term. Mm. And I'm wondering, Rashad, if the latest action now from ratings agency S&P Global, in which it downgraded us further into junk status last night, has, has made our debt even, even, even more expensive to service. It looks like it was also a non-event for the market, judging by what the RAND did today. But in terms of the, the bond market and what this means for the kind of interest bill we'll be paying or the bill that we'll be paying to these investors that still want our bonds, how does this change? Yeah, I think S&P has been uh, uh, more um, 
you know, they followed a certain playbook in terms of looking at South Africa, where they look at technicals and fundamentals, and that's why they've adjusted their ratings. In fact, they downgraded us two years ago. Moody's has been quite flexible, so they've established red lines, but whenever we breach those red lines, they've effectively moved the benchmark, and that's why they've allowed us to remain investment grade for a lot longer than we, we, we should have. But if you, so if you look at the bond market performance, you're seeing that we are, in the last two weeks, we're definitely in a risk-on mode in terms of the global environment. So the Fed has come through with some very strong statements. They're buying effectively $300 billion a month of treasuries. They're going, going into the high-yield market. And uh, Powell has come up and said he's used the term, whatever it takes. So that has pushed people into risk. And emerging markets eventually become a beneficiary of that. So the money first flows into investment grade, it flows into high yield, and now it's trickling in the last two weeks into emerging markets. And that's why you've seen this recovery in South Africa. And in this type of environment, ratings and more longer term factors become less important than the short term flood of money that's coming into emerging markets and spilling over from the developed markets. I think that in due course, because of South Africa's debt problem, like uh, James said, the debt to GDP ratio in South Africa is now at the stage where it's out of control. We need a concerted effort. If we can't do that, if we can't bring that debt to GDP trajectory back into line, then the fundamentals will reassert themselves and the bond yields will eventually rise at some point. The last two weeks, the global environment has been very conducive to risk, and that's why South Africa has been spared, even in this environment of poor fundamentals. Well, James, we're certainly quite thankful then for the action from your central bank that's willing to do whatever it takes at this stage and an emerging market like South Africa benefiting from that search for yield. Uh, Rashad is talking about the fact that in the short term, it's about getting in and getting out quick. Uh, we're not really looking at the long term fundamentals uh, for the, the economy, which are well known and which are not the prettiest. I just want to find out from you, even in the short term, I mean, are you are you are you going in um, co completely blind? Blind and is it all just about the yield or what kind of, of, of risks or concerns do you still have, even if you're only in our bond market for a short a space of time? To be clear, I think that this is a medium to long term investment opportunity. In the short term, the current risk on cycle is very temporary. The immediate actions that central banks around the world took at the introduction of the virus were an indication of their understanding of the medium and long-term catastrophic effects of the suspension of these economies will have. This risk on environment is temporary. Over the next several weeks and months, we will see data come out from governments around the world showing the actual impact of the virus. Feds understood what was coming, but they didn't have the data to act. They took preemptive measures, and those measures have, have given the market support here. However, when the data comes in, we'll understand how bad things actually are, and you're going to see an incredible amount of defaults from small businesses and consumers, and banks don't have risk models to lend in this environment. And so although banks may have support from governments, individuals and businesses don't have credit from banks. They are not lending in this environment. We think we're going to see a late Q2, early Q3, complete washout of markets, both bonds and stocks. And at that point, the markets are going to actually be depressed. In this state, we'll be bargain hunting. And when we're bargain hunting, we're looking for good opportunities. South Africa is a strong country. It's an important role member in the world. Um, and those bonds will be paid. And we're going to look to come in and purchase those bonds as we go into the recovery phase of the economic cycle when the COVID virus passes. Will they be paid? How sure are you about that, James? And I ask in the context of our land bank, um, a state-owned enterprise right. that has recently defaulted on some uh, bond payments as a result of COVID-19 and the, the liquidity challenges right. thereof. That, that event, uh, what, what, what did it translate to? What did it mean for you? So there will be facilities set up by agencies such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and others, there will be banks that come together as they always have during crises. There will be sovereign wealth funds. There will be sources of capital to inject into the economy and to inject onto the balance sheet of South Africa. Understand, when prices get depressed, 
when there are stressors to institutions, those are the best types of investment opportunities uh, that the deep pockets can do. And it's not just about rescuing the economy, it's about making a prudent investment as well. Um, and this downgrade at this phase of the COVID crisis is just the beginning. They're not going to let uh, South Africa slip into oblivion. There will be capital. It's not going to be cheap capital, and we have to be very careful about the budget deficit as well. Um, but over the long term uh, of stability, restoration from global e uh, that pull their capital together to provide a debt to South Africa uh, are going to make it a favorable investment candidate. And as I said, you know, this isn't the only country uh, that will be facing these challenges um, and there will be facilities set up and we will be there to profit. And uh, Rashad, just a final question for, from you. Will you will you be there? And in light of the, the the default of the land bank and the signals it has spread to some that you know, other state-owned enterprises who do have their bonds on the market could also follow. We do know that National Treasury is looking to come to issue uh, more bonds onto the market to uh, try and, and, and fund a part of that stimulus plan. Is this something you'd be advising clients to, to perhaps look at putting into their portfolios for the medium to long term? Yeah, I think that uh, getting this Whitby, getting the Moody's downgrade, I know I'll miss coming on CNBC talking to you, Fifi, about this every every month, but I think we need to forget about Whitby, forget about, C about uh, Moody's, and look at the fundamentals. And unfortunately, those are not in a good position. And I think National Treasury has actually dropped the ball on what, land, what they've done with Land Bank. To let a state-owned entity, which is 100% owned, which has government guarantees in place, to let it get to the point of default is actually quite reckless. I think that in the shorter term, yes, they've made some statements of support, but to actually get to the point where you've allowed Land Bank not to pay its debts instead of providing the necessary liquidity, you're going to find that private investors like ourselves and our fund and our investors are quite concerned, and we'll, we, we won't want to necessarily invest in Land Bank bonds going forward. So they've taken a situation where they might end up between institutions like the Saab, the PIC, uh, Treasury, they might end up having to fund the entire 30 billion land bank book. So I, I think Treasury um, has been distracted and I think they've dropped the ball on this and they haven't thought about the second order effect of their actions. And unfortunately, we ha they've been too slow to react on land bank as well as a number of things. And I think we need a, a very sharp turnaround from Minister Mboweni, uh, in concert with the Reserve Bank in terms of getting South Africa back on the right track because I think they're doing a lot to lose faith of the local investor base. Well, gentlemen, thanks so much for your, your insights. A very engaging conversation there. We will have to leave it there for now. That was Rashad Tayob, Fund Manager at Abex Investments and James McDonald, CEO and CIO of Hercules Investments. Uh,